Hey, what's up? How you doing? Welcome to my channel. This is Jewish Education at Home, and my name is Hannah. This channel is all about Judaism, spirituality, homeschooling, conversions to Judaism. I talk about a variety of topics all related to Jewish education at home on this channel and would love for you to subscribe and stick around a little bit. And this video, I'm really excited. It's a collaboration between me and Bethany and her channel is called Jewish Charlotte Mason Homeschooling. And this is a really fun collab because it's a Q&A, homeschooling Q&A, and it's really interesting to hear the questions that people have. And we're both gonna be answering them. So if you are from my channel, go check out Bethany's channel, Jewish Charlotte Mason Homeschooling, and you'll hear her perspective on the questions the answers to these questions. And if you are coming from Bethany's channel, Jewish Charlotte Mason Homeschooling, hi, welcome. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. And uh, let's get right into it. So the first question is, where do I begin? What is step one in terms of planning? So the first step I would say would be to know your state laws, okay? Know your laws. Um, I'll put a link below to where you can look that up as every state has its own homeschool laws got to know your laws. I would say also de-schooling, if you're coming from a school, uh, if you're pulling your child out of school, you have to de-school and transition to a homeschool. It's, it's healthy to not jump right into um, like school at home, right, when you're starting, and just have kind of like a chill period. I have a series on my channel about de-schooling and transitioning to homeschooling from school. So figured I'd add that in there and I'll put a link below. But as far as academics goes, set some realistic goals, right? What do you want your child to know by the end of the year? And then you kind of work backwards from there. And that also kind of ties into your state laws and what subjects are required to be taught and how much oversight you have and how much you have to chart back what, what it is that you're doing with your child and how much information you have to give your state. What you do in the year kind of is from that goal. So for example, if you have a five-year-old, maybe you want by the end of the year for your child to be able to read some sight words or do simple addition and subtraction. Or at least for me in, in our first year, I had these big goals in mind that were not realistic. And then I kind of like settled myself down and said, I just want my child to love to read. So that was my goal for that first year. Whatever the goal is, you'll have an end goal in mind and then what you do that year will kind of work off of that goal. And that goal will kind of guide you where to go throughout the year. Second question, how do I start with a high schooler? Okay, so first, first know your state laws. Uh, I know I'm kind of repeating the same thing I said in the other question, but it's very important to know your state laws. Um, and every state is different. Some have more oversight than other states, and some states will tell you exactly which subject which subjects are required. I would definitely recommend that you chart down what you did with your with your high schooler, what homeschool activities you did, field trips you went on, things that you learned, subjects, and be very specific. And um, that's going to come in handy later if you're high schooler decides that they want to take college classes while still in high school because many states and this goes back into knowing your state laws many states will allow a high schooler who is a homeschooler homeschooler high schooler <laughs> to take college classes and that chart and that like keeping track keeping record of what you did with your high schooler is gonna only be to your benefit as far as curriculum goes for a high schooler who's homeschooling um, you can make your own curriculum, you can do your own thing, but uh, that all goes back into your state requirements and the subjects that you're required to teach, if any, if there is so much oversight or how strict the state is. You can ask other homeschool families what they use and for which subject. It does take a bit of research on your part, um, but also take advantage of community resources. High school is a great age because there's volunteer opportunities that open up uh, work, opportunities open up and also again college classes may open up for your high schooler if it if they're interested and also I would say definitely get your teenager uh, involved in this in the whole process and in the whole planning third question what age should I get serious about finding a curriculum um, okay so you really don't need a curriculum if you don't want to use one 
And this is all completely up to the individual family. There is no right or wrong way to homeschool or right or wrong curriculum, right? It's all what is best for you and your family and your child and how it all plays together, right? If you're looking for a specific age, uh, the question was about a specific age. So I would say, again, not to like keep repeating the same thing, but you know, it's true. Look up your state laws. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's age six that they require you to be registered as a homeschooler and to get serious about homeschooling. Other states is age eight. But also it's so individual to your family um, because like I know with my one child, when she was like four, I felt like she just wanted to do worksheets because she saw my other daughter doing worksheets. So we bought her this book in Sam's Club for like $8. It was a whole preschool curriculum. <laughs> And uh, we did some of it together and she traced letters and she counted and you know, it was like little fun stuff. And she liked that and that worked for her and that worked for me. There's no right or wrong age really to having a curriculum. It's really totally up to you and what you feel like your child can handle. Question number four, which books, which curriculum, how to do research? So I'm gonna tell you YouTube, right, is a great resource. Go on YouTube. There's unlimited infinite amount of homeschooling mom channels out there that give you flip throughs of every single curriculum out there every single workbook out there right and like feel free to reach out to them because a lot of uh, homeschool moms who are on YouTube myself included are really passionate and really want to share and help other homeschoolers who may need some more information I mean, I've definitely myself, when I see a curriculum that someone did a flip through of, I reach out to them, I'll email them if they have an email or I'll make a comment. Usually as long as they're an active channel, yes, you will get a response and they're really helpful. Their homeschool moms are some of the best people because there's no judgment. It's just, we just love homeschooling and we just wanna share, right? So I would say YouTube is definitely uh, one way to do research. Right now there are four Jewish homeschooling YouTube channels. <laughs> Yay! So I'll post a link below to all four of those and I hope you check it out and get some perspectives and you know ask questions. Ask tons of questions. There's no silly questions and there's no judgment. We've all been there. We all know what it's like to start out homeschooling and how hard it can be. Um, also I would say Aniva Ami has, um, a, it has a vast book list articles there's tons of information on their website and i'll put a link below to that and facebook groups the jewish homeschooling facebook group it i think personally is phenomenal i really love hearing what people have to say and everyone's different perspectives if you're looking for a more professional like homeschool consultant um there is cmplenary.com i'll put a link below to that and you can speak to someone who will help guide you through the process of getting started homeschooling or wherever you are in your homeschool. Even if you're a veteran homeschooler, everyone needs support and some help at times. So I'll put a link below to that as well. And I hope this answers your question. How do you handle kids that wake up in a not doing school today mood? And I'll tell you what I do. And I'm not saying that this is going to work for every single family, but maybe it'll give you some ideas. Um, so I personally generally don't do school in the mornings because nobody wants to do school in the mornings. My kids, all of my kids, playing is so important for them the moment they wake up. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Even when they were in school, they would wake up and they would just need to play. So I work with that. I see that that's really a need of theirs. There's no use for me fighting it with them. We don't start davening till 10.30, 11, 11.30, something like that. I do have things that I do want to get done every single day and davening is definitely one of them. And I do have a few other daily learning that I find very important that we learn every single day. But if they're not in the mood, so for davening, I do less. Okay, so sometimes less is more. I do three songs <laughs> and then that's it and we're done but for me it's more important that they're having a connection with God and praying even though it's just a couple songs that takes about literally maybe a minute and a half <laughs> than to not do it at all and, and then also the daily learning that I do do every day they do enjoy it but not every day are they in the mood and that's totally normal so with that I'll play with the times 
like sometimes I'll do it at supper time or sometimes I'll do it at bedtime. Usually bedtime really works out well for us because everyone's kind of settled and like, you know, not so stimulated in the daytime, especially in the, in the nice weather out when it's bright and sunny and they just, you know, want to be outside and run and they have lots of energy. Also, bedtime is such a good time for like journaling, writing, reading, math problems. I really like using bedtime, but I don't like it also because then I go to bed later. <laughs> so it's a balance and you just have to play around with it, trial and error, see what works. You know, and sometimes you might just say, you know what, we'll just pick it up tomorrow. And that's that. And this is the last question. How do you teach interpersonal skills without a large group? So I'll share my perspective here, um, but just a disclaimer is that I personally am pretty introverted. <laughs> I generally keep to myself. I love my family. I love my friends. I love my community very, very much, but just day to day, I generally keep to myself. <laughs> so that's, this is kind of like my perspective on socializing and teaching interpersonal skills, and it may not align with what other people's perspectives. But, you know, here we go. Large groups don't necessarily teach social skills to young people, right? Because I just see it as large groups many times causes stress and it causes low self-esteem because everyone's trying to fit in with each other. Kids are gonna learn social skills and interpersonal skills from watching parents, from watching the adults in their life. They're watching how you speak to your spouse, they're watching how you speak to them, they're watching how you speak to um, your friends and family on the phone, uh, how you interact with other people, how you're handling it when someone, you know, kind of gets rude to you <laughs> if you're standing in the checkout line or whatever, you know, they're watching you, how you, how you socialize, how you interact. So personally, I feel like kids will learn better interpersonal skills by being with adults, not with other kids. Although I'm not saying that being with other kids is not important, and I'm not saying not to expose your children to large groups. Obviously now we're in the corona time, so we're not gonna be exposed to large groups. Um, but I just find throwing them into a crowd, like in a school setting, throwing them into a crowd and you know having them figure it out, I don't find that to be healthy. I don't find that to be a way to teach healthy social skills or interpersonal skills like teaching manners, teaching good habits, saying please, saying thank you, having gratitude when someone, you know, gives you a gift or whatever. Like these kinds of things you can teach in a homeschool that you can't teach when they're at school from, you know, the morning till late afternoon. Also, I'm going to add right here that if you feel like your child needs help with social skills or if your child is digressing, call your pediatrician. Thank you so much for all these questions. You can always reach out to either one of us and make sure to check out Bethany's channel, Jewish Charlotte Mason Homeschooling, and make sure to subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.